V. Here we are on another Friday at 11 a.m., the standard OpenZD TV time. Uh, I'm your host, Clint. Today, it's a, it's a reasonable day here in Western New York. It's not the best day, but it's not terrible either. Um, and today, I am uh, shooting solo here. No Ken this week. Ken's uh, busy doing other things. So those of you who want to see Ken, uh, maybe next time. Um, this week, we are going to do something that hopefully will be interesting. It's going to be a real basic primer about what Zero Trust even is, and then on top of that, uh, a little bit about OpenZD. So um, I'm oftentimes active on our discourse, and we had a couple of users this week who had some questions, and one of them was around uh, just understanding the different concepts that there are in OpenZD. And it made me think, you know, I haven't done a nice overview of OpenZD lately, so this would be a good time to go back and rehash what OpenZD even is, um, how do you use it, what it might be, why you would want to use it, and that sort of things. I've also done something I've never done before on ZDTV. I made an agenda and an agenda slide. Ooh, everybody's so excited about that. Look at that, how much effort I put into this. So this is kind of uh, the, the agenda that I think we're going to follow today. Um, I'm also going to exclusively rely on our documentation. And so I'm going to do that because if there's a gap in our doc as I go through this, um, I want to be able to identify what, what that gap might be. And so here we go. Let's talk a little bit about OpenZD. All right, let's first show up over to our doc page. This is what our doc page looks like as of the summer of 2023. Who knows when you're viewing this video, but as of 2023 right now, this is what it looks like. Um, I've actually uh, shrank it down or made it bigger because uh, it doesn't quite fit on the screen. I, I want to make it so that, you know, it's big enough for everybody to see, so I'm going to make it bigger. But this is what it looks like. And you'll come to the, the landing page here, and you'll see a little bit about the different environments that there are, the OpenZD uh, open source um, only approach where you want to host it yourself. You don't want somebody else to host your, your network for you. We have Cloud ZD, which is the um, software as a service or network as a service, the cloud-based version of OpenZD. Same stuff, just managed by NetFoundry as opposed to you having to manage it yourself. There's also a free thing that's called Teams. So you can use Teams up to 10, net po uh, 10 endpoints. We'll talk about some of this stuff later. And there's Zeds, which is uh, focusing more towards, you know, SDK developers, people who aren't very interested in um, setting up an overlay network, even, even a, a little bit, right? Like taking an even more uh, streamlined approach. But on this page, you'll see um, you know, we're talking about software is, that is secure by design. The overall premise of OpenZD itself is really about application embedded zero trust. So what is even zero trust? Uh, I have a couple slides I use. I'm just going to talk about what zero trust is. But really, zero trust is this concept, and it's, it's kind of a bad term. You can't throw a, a, a rock into the internet without figuring or seeing some company that claims to be zero trust, right? Um, so zero trust to me is really not about having no trust. And when you go online and you talk in various forums, they might laugh at you for the term zero trust because it is kind of a silly term. But really what it means is having no trust and having explicit trust, very different things. It's not about no trust. It's about having very explicit trust. So you're not just trusting that somebody who shows up at your website is valid, you know, is a verifiable, valid person. You actually have to go through and explicitly verify them. So you are explicitly trusting them. Uh, but explicit trust, maybe it doesn't sound as cool as zero trust. So that's really at, at its base level, what I think zero trust is about, explicitly trusting everything. And that goes for the network itself, that goes for clients of the network, uh, that goes for the uh, services that individual identities or people or clients can access, all of those sorts of things all combine into one. And so as far as, you know, why would you want zero trust? I mean, uh, just look around and see how many ransomware type of attacks there are, how many um, data breaches there are, right? Like why zero trust? Hopefully it should be pretty obvious. Um, it's not 
always, we sometimes we get into the trap, I think, of, you know, it's good enough. What, right? Our security right now is good enough. It usually works. There's an, a, an age old adage that says, you know, it's, it's not if you're going to get hacked, it's when you're going to get hacked. And that's largely true, right? Like with people coming online and, and there being more and more and more applications out there, obviously the pool of people to attack gets larger. And so the, um, interest of people to attack those targets gets larger when something becomes popular. Obviously that's going to get attacked first, but, uh, so many people, I mean, you read all the time about, um, Postgres database just being exposed online, uh, not having secure by default in its, in its very nature. And that's what zero trust and that's what OpenZ is really trying to solve, right? If you could take all those zero trust principles and just bake them into the application first, so we call it building it in, not bolting it on. If you could do that first, then that would be amazing. And so that's really what OpenZD is all about. And that's what Zero Trust in a, hopefully in a real quick nutshell is all about. Uh, and why Zero Trust? And I'm, I've never done this before. Like, tell me in the comments, right? What do you think Zero Trust is? Do you think I'm crazy? Like, maybe you're reading this or watching this, uh, you know, in the future. You're like, hey, it's not Zero Trust. Uh, tell me why. Tell us why. Um, so that's a little bit about Zero trust and why zero trust. All right, so now let's see, somebody's calling me. I put my phone on vibrate for that very reason. Let's go back and look at our agenda again. So that's a little bit about what is zero trust, a little bit about why zero trust. So now let's talk about some actual OpenZD concepts. And we're gonna talk about this term overlay. Let's go back to the doc. And when you, when you come here, at the top, you'll see a documentation link. Go ahead and click on that documentation link. You'll see a little bit about what is OpenZD. It looks like Restream fixed the nasty bug. Those of you who watch routinely will know uh, when I'm sharing my screen lately, the mouse has been jumping all over the place, but it looks like it's fixed now, so that's cool. Uh, they tell me that it was a brave bug, but you know, I don't care. I just know that it's fixed. So if we look at what is OpenZD here and we take a look at what composes an OpenZD overlay, we gotta first start top by talking about what is an overlay. The overlay is a term that uh, means something that lays on top of something else, right? Like you overlay something under, that is the overlay goes over something, uh, something is under something that is overlaying it. There we go, that, that'll, that'll work. Look up the definition, you know what I'm saying. Um, so, so an overlay network, is a network that works on top of another network, on top of an underlay network. Uh, almost always the underlay network is going to be TCP IP, UDP, something like that. It's gonna be IP, an IP based network. The standard network that we all know and love and have used and maybe are exploring for the first time. So that's what an overlay network means. It's a network that's built on top of another and the overlay network for OpenZD is built on top of IP. And so we have an overlay network and it's composed of a few different uh, components. Who, people just keep calling me. Um, composed of a few different components. We'll throw that phone over there so I can't even hear it anymore. Um, the first thing is the controller. So the controller's job is a very important. Oh, in fact, if you um, go to our doc, let's see, uh, components, key, key concepts, is under key concepts. Dark services and routers, we don't wanna get into that yet. Components, this is what I wanted, yeah. OpenZD controller. You can read about what the controller is and we'll talk about the router. So you should be able to read about the same sort of stuff that I'm going to talk about. So the controller's job in life is controlling authentication and authorization. It's also where your uh, overlay model is is uh, kept. So that is the basically the configuration of your network. Um, and it's responsible for basically seeding the overlay network. You need to create a controller first before you can do anything else because that's where you're gonna interact with. Uh, we have something that we call a uh, command line interface, a CLI, and that CLI is used to manage the overlay network. But we also have uh, something that not every open source project provides. We also have a UI that you could use if you don't like command line interfaces. I'm gonna bounce between both today, I think, um, depending on what we do. We might explore one or the other. Um, but the controller's job is to seed that over overlay network to control your, your model and also um, uh, control authentication and authorization. And so we'll see some of that in action later. 
Then we have these things we call routers and routers, oftentimes you'll see them called edge routers or routers, they're the same thing. Uh, a router's purpose is to basically to uh, form a mesh to get your traffic from one side of the network to the other side of the network, wherever that network is. I didn't say the internet, even though in our diagram here, it says internet. If you are fortunate enough and you have your own bespoke uh, fiber network, you can certainly run OpenZD over that. You can run it uh, in a tr actual, to the actual term, air-gapped environment. So, you know, maybe you have your own entire network. You can run it entirely on your own network. It's not necessary that it's on the internet. What is necessary is you have to understand when a component tries to uh, interact with another component on the network, there needs to be a network path there, right? That sounds obvious. Hopefully it is obvious, but it's not necessarily the internet. You can run all this stuff on your local home network, like I'll do, uh, or you can run it all on your own private, you know, fiber network or your own satellite network or whatever. <clears throat> so an edge router's job is to uh, control the data plane, as we'll call it. And this is uh, receiving sessions from clients, as well as uh, transmitting that data from one side to the other side. Um, and uh, it'll form a mesh uh, we will refer to as a mesh network. And so if one particular node goes down, you can uh, be assured that the network will heal itself and reroute the traffic all on your behalf. And so that's very cool, very friendly. And so that's what the router's job are. It's just to get the data from one side to the other side and very securely. Also notice in the diagram, all these little lock icons. Zero trust about having explicit trust. Every single piece of the overlay will have a mutual TLS configuration. And that means that the controller, in order to talk to the controller, you're going to the router, the um, the, the pieces of the network will need to present a certificate that verifies the identity of the um, connecting component. And that connecting component will also verify the identity of the server. Very important, that mutual TLS. So you'll see those little lock icons throughout the diagram here as well. Um, and then we have uh, clients. And so if we go back to our overview slide again, which is here, yeah. So we talked a little bit about the controller, we talked a little bit about the router, and we have these things we call tunnelers or clients or SDKs. And they're also important too, because they're the outside of the puzzle. They're the, the edge, if you will. And that's where the term edge router comes from, right? It's the router that the edge will touch that, and the edge meaning some device somewhere. Uh, and that device can be, operated by a human, a person can be on the other end of that device, or it could be Fargate, you know, Amazon, or it could be some server somewhere, right? It doesn't, doesn't particularly matter. Um, but that tunneler is the client for the overlay network. And when you start thinking about zero trust and you start trying to implement a network, you have basically three levels of zero trust. And I'm gonna go and use our doc here. And I, if, you, if you use our doc, Fun tip, you can type control K. It's right up here in the upper right hand corner. It even says control K, but it's maybe not obvious because it's a little gray, right? Or you can just click the search bar and, and search. I'm going to search for zero trust network access, ZTNA. And that is a model. And this is generally the model that most zero trust vendors, uh, no, I shouldn't say most, many zero trust vendors will claim is zero trust. And so what is zero trust network access? It means that um, basically you're going to put implicit trust into your uh, device, into your home network or your private network. But whenever you leave your trusted zone, you're going to go over a zero trust connection. And so this is this would be like a router to another router type of connection. And lots of people think that this is perfectly fine. Zero trust network access is great. It's, it's quote unquote good enough for me. And so um, it's used. I don't, I don't have a problem with zero trust network access. It's not the best. I prefer the next couple levels and we'll get into those in a second. But it is very important to understand that this is perfectly valid. Uh, lots of uh, solutions are zero trust networking access only. Um, and it's entirely reasonable to think that this is uh, a, a, a deployment model. And so OpenZD supports zero trust network access. And there's also uh, zero trust host access. So if we look at these zero trust models here, uh, you can see we have, they maybe maybe they should be in a different order, 
But um, maybe not. Maybe application access is the best order. And maybe this page should be reordered because, oh, never mind. It's in the right order. I just searched for the wrong one first. <laughs> so Zero Trust Network Access is the last one listed because OpenZD focuses mostly on application access. Because if you'll notice the difference with application access, you don't trust your local network. You don't even trust your host network. You trust no actual network. You are explicitly uh, trusting everything as opposed to network access where you might traverse your local host network and then your local actual network until you get to a router. And so that's uh, a, a few minutes on zero trust network access. Zero trust host access would be somewhere in the middle. Um, yeah, right there. Zero trust host access somewhere in the middle. And so zero trust host access is, is great because you only have to trust your local network. And I'm going to demonstrate zero trust host access here in a minute. Um, oh, assuming we get through it because I can already see 16 minutes into this basic overview. So, <clears throat> um, that's zero trust host access is when you'll have something like a tunneler running. Oh, that's why I got into this tunnelers. Uh, so a tunneler is a special client that the OpenZD project provides. And its job is to intercept traffic at a client like my computer here. I have three screens, one here, one here, and one here. And my tunneler is now on that screen. Um, and so the tunneler's job is to intercept traffic and get that traffic to a router. So if we go back to the documentation and we go back to the uh, overview, the job of the tunneler it is a special SDK client. So you'll see SDK is listed here. OpenZD is exclusively API and SDK based. So our tunneler is just a purpose built SDK application, which is able to intercept traffic and understands some basic configuration blocks that OpenZD, the project itself provides. We might get in the com I'm, configs are on my list of um, agenda items. So config is on my list and we'll talk about what a config is in a minute. But a tunneler is a purpose-built SDK-based application that can, uh, can intercept traffic and put it onto the OpenZD overlay so that the overlay can then route the traffic to its final destination, which is wherever that target might be. All right. And so that's a little bit about tunnelers. Um, so now we're going to get into the basics of OpenZD itself. At the end of the day, people are going to try to, they, they have, probably, you probably have an app and you want to protect that app, right? Like that is generally what you want, whether it's RDP, whether it's VNC, whether it's SSH, whether it's a web server, whatever that application is, you probably are coming to OpenZD because you understand Zero Trust, what it's about, and you want to protect that particular application. And so we call those, the, those applications services. And a service in OpenZD's world uh, really is nothing more than a knitting of two configurations together. And so a configuration is a, a bit of, um, I don't want to say configuration, but it's uh, a config is basically some instructions. There we go. Some instructions to the SDK that tell it to do something. And so that something on a client might be to intercept a particular address. So if we go back to my client here, we can see I have two identities. I didn't talk about identities yet. I should talk a little bit about identities. In OpenZD's parlance, an identity is a cryptographically strong document. So we're using X509 certificates. It doesn't have to be X509 certificates, but that's what's here on my local computer. I don't want to get into the differences between what those identities might be, but just know that there's a strong cryptographically verifiable identity on my local computer. And I, my computer is presenting that to the OpenZD overlay in order to authenticate itself. Once it's authenticated, OpenZD then authorizes the identity for a various services. Here you can see I have a identity. I'm going to make this bigger. I have one, two identities, but we're just, we'll just focus on this top of this bottom one. Here at NetFoundry, the company that sponsors OpenZD, we have a Mattermost instance. And that Mattermost instance is protected by OpenZD, right? Maybe you want your own private chat app. So you could deploy Mattermost and then do the same sort of thing. Um, so I have an identity, which is that strong cryptographical verifi cryptographically verifiable identity that 
is uh, allowing me to authenticate to a network. Also notice this tunneler being purpose built allows me to have more than one identity. So I actually have two identities in this tunneler at this time. I've had four, I've had 10, right? You can have as many identities as you want. Um, but in this case, this identity is granting me the privilege of getting onto the network that provides Mattermost, that chat app, which I was talking about. And you can see this identity is configured with two different intercepts. One of ZD's superpowers, actually services, I should say. Um, one of ZD's superpowers, in my opinion, is this thing we call private DNS. Or really, I don't know. I call it private DNS. I don't know if everybody does, but it's private DNS. Basically, what, what that means is um, you can make up an, I, an, a DNS name that your computer will be able to resolve. So, for example, if we look at uh, all of these look like reasonable. Here, here's a good one. Mops API docs dot preview, right? That, that, ident that uh, DNS entry doesn't exist in the real world. This is, uh, it's from Ken even. This is just something that Ken sure, you know, created that he materialized out of thin air. Netfoundry.io is an actual domain name, but you can see you can also shadow those domain names. So this is private DNS. If I was not authenticated, if, if I had turned off my client, I wouldn't have access to these DNS names. And so mattermost.tools.netfoundry.io, if I were to copy this, and we can see it's on port 443, so we know it's TCP, sorry, HTTPS. If I were to go over to here, HTTPS, colon, slash, slash, you'll see I get traffic. And and so I've done what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to be able to access that. If you try that right now, and you're not on this work, go ahead and try it. I'll wait. Uh, mattermost. Uh, dot tools dot net foundry dot io right if you tried that right now you'll see that it resolves but you can't get there and that's a great example of a service that's protected by zd and that's what a service is a service is just a a string of configurations in this case we have two because for mattermost i have a client side configuration we'll call that an intercept configuration and then on the far side i have a a host side configuration or a binding configuration that tells OpenZD to offload this traffic somewhere. If we were to go back to the documentation, here my SDK is the tunneler. I'm accessing Mattermost. It's traversing the network over to the API, which is Mattermost. And so on this side, we're offloading. I don't know if we are using a, a tunneler or if we're using an edge router to offload the traffic. It doesn't matter. Um, but I, I expect it's a router because generally we deploy routers in server areas. <clears throat> Is the cool UI included? Uh, uh, we have a, we have a comment. We have a comment. Let's show it. We can show the comment. Is the cool UI. This UI, this UI is our preview UI of the uh, existing desktop edge for Windows. So let me bring up the existing one. Here's what the existing one looks like. And here's what the new one looks like. So uh, yes, both of these are included and they are both open source projects that you can go and take and modify and change or, you know, or not or contribute to, whatever. Um, so this one right here is the desktop UI project. If we we're, if were to go to GitHub, oh, actually going back to the docs, you can click on the GitHub link and then you can go to, uh, I think it's a desktop edge UI. And there's all the source code for this particular um, um, preview. So you can go out here and download it from the releases project. Currently it supports both Linux and windows, uh, Mac, hopefully someday soon, but it's the desktop UI. It's not the mobile UI. All right. So, uh, that's the tunneler and sending data to Mattermost. All right. That's uh, that's a little bit about a service. We haven't looked at what it configures yet. We'll look at this config stuff in a minute. I just want to get the basic basics out of the way first. So we talked about a service, we talked about a config, and now we're going to talk about a service policy. And actually, I went out of order. Identities, uh, we already kind of covered too. So um, only thing that's left is service policy. So it's great that we have this service that starts with a tunneler and ends in Mattermost in this case, but we have to authorize that particular service. So with a zero trust overlay, everything's about implicit sorry, explicit trust, not implicit trust, in order to obtain access to one of these services, me, or in 
better parlance, my identity, this mattermost.clintoblock.desktop identity, had to have been granted the rights, the privilege, the ability to access the Mattermost service. There are probably more than two services on this network, but I've granted access to only two of them. I haven't granted, you know, our Mattermost administration team did. So um, I've been granted access to two services here. And that is a, a form of service discovery because the SDK is basically informed that new services have existed. And then that SDK application, that tunneler, is written in a way that materializes uh, a message to the UI. And the UI is told, hey, there are new services. And so the UI displays them. And so we can go through that process here in a moment too. Uh, and that's configuration, and that's a little bit about service policies. Service policies are the way in which you authorize identities to perform a task on a service, either bind a service or dial a service. And that's a real basic overview of OpenZD. And so now I thought what would be cool is if we actually go through and like, you know, do some fun stuff, meaning... I'm going to look at a console and hopefully it doesn't scare people away, but here's a, a terminal and I'm going to, this is a, a machine that is currently running in Amazon. Uh, let's see, do I have any services? So I'm going to run sudo system status ZD controller. And it says it is inactive. It is dead. Good. Uh, this is one of my dev machines. So what we're going to do here live is we're going to go through the entire quick start and you can find the quick starts under quick starts. Wow. What a good name and host it anywhere. I'm going to run the quick start host it anywhere, but I'm going to give you a sneak preview. I didn't tell anybody this. I'm going to actually install browser too. So we'll see what browser is in a minute, but let's just install our open ZD overlay network first. So you can see, we can follow from some of this instructions. I've done this so many times and I don't want to bore you. You can go out to our doc and read our doc. Also notice this is not the, the proper URL. This is the preview documentation for the browser bring up stuff that I'm, I'm working on. So when we talk about browser, this is, you can go to this preview. It's out there and you can get to it. But usually the doc is at openzd.io. Okay. If you don't type two dots, it'll get there. Openzd.io. There you go. That's where the normal doc is. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and start our, uh, our journey. And so... The first thing that I did that is not relevant to most people, but I've actually gone out to a thing called Let's Encrypt. And if you've never gone to Let's Encrypt, it is a certificate authority. <clears throat> Their job in life is they're bringing um, secure X509 certificates to everybody for free. And so that's really awesome of them. And so if I go over to my terminal again, if I look at my Etsy, Let's Encrypt Live um, folder directory. You'll see I have a hosted anywhere demo.openzd.org. How very convenient. Almost like I planned it. All right, so that's our hosted anywhere directory. So I'm going to use that. And the doc is not quite up to date yet on this little step. So, you know, if you follow along, it's cool. You can just, you know, close your eyes for two seconds while I do one thing which is I'm going to set a couple of new environment variables, PKI alt server cert, PKI alt server key, that will just allow me to run the quick start easier. In fact, if you go back and look at the doc right here, you'll see I actually uh, uh, and to follow. This is not the one. I want to follow the browser steps. You'll see in the browser steps, I actually talk about um, running this particular command right here. So we're going to run these commands, and then we're going to follow the host to anywhere quick start, which is right here. All right, so I ran those two commands. Again, this is we're going to just deploy an entire network here while I blather. And then I'm, I've already run this particular command because uh, it makes things easier for me. So that's my external DNS. I'm just going to copy this block, and I'm just going to run it exactly as is. And so there it goes. And then once that's complete, now what I need to do is I need to run the express install. Again, copy, flip over, and paste. Then uh, hopefully you can't copy that password quickly enough, or you can, and then you can go hack my machine if you want. But whatever. Right now what's happening is it's deploying an entire 
overlay network for me. It'll deploy that controller and it'll deploy an edge router for me, which is the baseline that you need in order to run an OpenZD overlay network. And so it's creating a PKI. I thought PKI was probably too much to get into for a basic kind of video, but we can go over PKIs if people want PKIs. And so it's creating a whole entire uh, complicated on purpose PKI that, you know, is useful for uh, PKI, sorry, uh, public key infrastructure. That is the X509 certificates. That's the, the uh, cryptographically verifiable stuff that I was talking to earlier. So it's gone through, it's deployed a controller and it has now set up an edge router and said, Hey, it's done. And then it tells me my password, which I'll clear the screen real quick. So nobody can go back and steal the password. I'm going to delete this environment afterwards anyway. So, you know, let's hope nobody of you do that. The next thing we can do is we can create a system D unit file. This is really helpful because, um, if the computer goes off and comes back on again, you probably want your network to go off and on again too. And so that's what this will do. It'll create a system D unit file and then I'll enable that system D unit. And so I'll copy it. I'll run system CDL dim reload, and then I'll enable those two. We'll do it. Oops. We'll do those two. all that. Now it's very quick. Boom, boom, boom. All done. And then at this point, we'll just run a couple commands using system CDL again to see if things are running. And this just gives us a, hey, look, it's active and active. Cool. So at this point I should be able to type ZD login and see that ZD worked. And I can do a ZD edge list services. Remember we talked about services. There are none as there shouldn't be. All right. So now we've got things installed. That is the end. I mean, like that's, that's it. Like we've installed an overlay network and, and I blathered for probably five minutes. You know, if, if you're used to it, like I am, you can do that in like a minute. Um, now the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to prove that, uh, I can access the, um, an alternative URL. So this is important for uh, browser stuff, but if you go to controller.host anywhere, you'll see that it actually exists and it's presenting that alternative alternative server search that I was talking about from Let's Encrypt. And so if I go down and I show you this, it comes from ISRG root X1, which is the Let's Encrypt certificate authority. So cool. I have a uh, controller that has alternative server certs deployed as well as the internal PKI deployed. So you can see, I can also go to this URL and then I get the scary, oh, you can't trust this site because it's self-signed, but it's your certificate. So of course you can trust it. You know that you just deployed this thing, right? And so that's, uh, that's both PKIs in action. Just a little note there. We're going to continue on and we're going to install the Zach next, the ZD administration console. And so here's our Zach bring up. And I find it's just easiest to just copy and paste the commands, copy, paste, off it goes. Now you do need to install uh, NPM and let's see, it'll tell you, uh, you need NPM and node and it has to be 16 plus, but I've already cloned the module. So now let me go ahead and run the installation of the Zach. All this does is just basically compiles the project for you. So off that will go chug, chug, chug. I'm gonna enable TLS for the Zach. So I'm going to copy this little block right here. And then I'm going to, again, create a systemd file, reload systemd and enable it. And that way, when I'm done with all this, I should be able to go to HTTPS. Actually, let me, uh, I don't remember what that URL was. I want that big ugly URL, this one. Now I should be able to go, not here. I want to go to 8443. Four four three, and that should work and it didn't love it <laughs> so let's see what i did wrong let's do uh ss minus lntp and we'll see if 8443 is listening it's not journal ctl dash fu zd console so this is probably oh i see it's it's not it's only listening on 1408 it's not listening on 8443 like it should that is an indication that my copy and paste of this didn't work. So I'm going to run this again. Oh, the, the files exist. So now let's see, what if I cat the server certificate? Uh, very much not the key, but I can cat the server, server certificate. 
there's a certificate there. Well, I must admit, I don't know what I might have done wrong. Oh, server star. I have a key. I have a certificate. Oh, that's what I got wrong. Is the doc wrong? Server chain, server key. Okay, I'm going to copy these things again. Do this. File exists, file exists. Server.key. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is wrong. No. Why is that? Hmm. Anybody see what I did wrong? I don't I don't see what I did wrong. Uh, it's you know, it's it's actually not gonna matter for my browser demo because I'm gonna actually create a service anyway. Yeah, I'm surprised. I'm gonna figure that out. We'll see. Let's keep on going and we'll see what happens. Um okay, so I've run a bunch of CLI commands and those things were all useful to stand everything up. And so the next thing I, I'm actually gonna do, uh, again, this is a preview of the browser bring up. Um, browser is technology that will bootstrap a zero trust connection in your browser, not with a Z, with an S browser, and really neat stuff. Uh, so in order to do that, I need a edge router that has web socket binding. And so I'm going to come in here and I'm going to find my edge bindings and I'm going to add this right here so that my browser stuff will be able to find an edge router. And then I'm going to restart my router. And if I do an SS minus LNTP, I should see 8447 now being listening along with 8442, which are the actual, let's do sudo on that one which is ZD and process ID this, and that process ID, privacy, pipe grab for this, that pro, no, that should be the right PID. Is it still running? Two, five, yeah, two, six, four, four, five. Maybe, maybe PS doesn't want to let me grab for the PID. Do I have to provide the PID? Is it minus P? No, I never remember. Mm -hmm. Let's look. Let's look. Yeah, it should have been there. Interesting. Well, this is going to be the router. Uh, let's, let's look for router instead. Maybe I got a grip instead. I got a grip for router. Here it is. Two, six, four. Yeah, there it is. And so those two listening ports are on a process that is the router. So now the router has been configured with two listening ports, one for uh, regular data connections and one for WebSocket data connections. All right. Well, that's fun. Um, let's see what else we were going to now configure a service. Uh, so in order to configure a service, let's go ahead and, and I, I need that Zach. I want that Zach bring up. You know what I do? I do need it because in order to show Zach, I need 8443 working. So give me one second while I diagnose this particular problem and what I might have done wrong here. I don't see exactly what it is. The ZD console is expecting a certificate in the directory which has the node uh, file itself and i see a key in there and i see the chain to the chain so i don't know why so let's just restart zach sudo system seedle restart zd console then let's look at journal ctl zd console Okay, but maybe uh, maybe it was a timing thing. Maybe I goofed it up. I don't know. But now it's listening on 8443. And now when I come here, I'm going to get the Zach is uh, being presented. And I'm going to be able to go to the Zach. And I'm going to be able to establish my, uh, my Zach so that it can talk to this controller. And so now this is my uh, host it anywhere controller. And the URL is easy because it's the same machine, 8441. Now I know my password is admin and I actually don't know what my password is. I'm not going to do it on that screen. <laughs> GD password. I'm going to put that on my clipboard, come back and paste. And then you'll see the ZD admin console. So this is what the UI looks like when you deploy your own network and you're going to go and make your very first service. Now, the very first service I want is I want to make a service that hides my Zach. 
so that I don't need to have 8443 available on the open internet. I'm going to use HTTP and port eight, uh, 1408. We've already seen that Zach has told us that it's listening on 1408 as well as 8443. So we're gonna make a service that offloads traffic from the server that I just provisioned back to itself so that I can provide Zach securely, but using OpenZD. And so this will give you a good soup to nuts. Here's what you need to do. And so let's go ahead and do that. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make myself an identity. So I'm gonna click on the plus. I'm gonna give the identity a name. I'll call it Flint, host it anywhere. Uh, I'm gonna give it some attributes. I don't need to give it any attributes, but I can just say host it anywhere uh, identities. So this is just an attribute and an attribute is a way of grouping entities. In this case, we're grouping ident identities and we're calling it hosted anywhere identities. The identity type does not matter. It is uh, whatever you want it to be. You can choose between user and service and device. And so you can make it a user and I'm going to say it's not a, an administrator. Uh, the enrollment type, one-time token, generally what you want. This is, uh, uh, when you're starting out, it's definitely what you want. This will give you a token which your uh, tunneler can use to enroll this identity and that'll be me. Uh, then you select an authentication policy. You know, there's only one, so we'll just use the default. We don't need to map an external ID, but we could. And then uh, at the end, if we do browser, we'll see some of this. Uh, and then now I just click save. And then when you see what you'll see, if you should see, uh, where's my identity? Interesting. I hope Jeremy's watching. I should see a token. I don't see a token. Hmm. We could have just hit a bug. Let's go ahead and delete this identity and try again. This time I'm just going to type, I'm going I'm to type as much information. Clint, host it anywhere. Role attributes. I'm going to use that. And then I'm going to just click save. Well, what we have here is a bug. And I don't know what that bug is and why. I should have a token here. And I don't have a token here. Very interesting. Let's, uh, let's look at what did it run is administrator false auth policy default external id is empty huh well let's, let's see what happens if i create the identity out here zd edge create identity and again we're going to use the cli this time create identity oh i'm in the way aren't i let's uh let's do this no this hmm Whatever, I guess it's no better. All right, ZDH create identity. This is going to be Clint via uh, CLI host it anywhere. And then we're going to give it an output file. The same thing. Well, it anywhere.jwt. I do that every single time. Create identity user Clint. All right, so now if we come back to Zach. And we uh, hit escape. Where's that? Oh, that's funny. That's another bug. That little X window should be X Xable wherever I am. And let's go back and click on identities. I don't see my token. I think it's just a UI issue. All right. Well, whatever. I should have a token here. Um, we called it Clint. Yeah. So I have a token here. So there's a UI bug that we got to fix. All right, um, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to exit this machine, go to my temp directory, SCP, particular, oh boy, it's in a ugly location. SCP from my Amazon machine at this location, this token here. And so I'm just copying that token to myself. I'm going to use the uh, UI to add an identity and we're gonna add Temp, it's on the screen. Let's bring that, where's my mouse? Bring this screen over to here. And so there'll be a Clint via CLI host anywhere. So let's go ahead and, and do that. You'll see now my shows up and it has no services as we would expect. Okay, so let's come back on over here. And so now we've made our identity. The next thing we need to do is we need to make this service. And so we'll come to services, we'll click plus. 
give the service a name. This will be uh, HTTP, Zach. I'm not going to give it any attributes, terminus, strategy, all that stuff, just leave blank. But what we're going to do is we're going to make an intercept config. And it says, do you want to select a predefined one or add a new one? In this case, I'm going to add a new one. I'm going to call it uh, HTTP Zach in intercept v1. Sure. Oop, let me, yeah. And then uh, the address. So I'm going to make this, we're going to, we're going to just invent one. It'll be HTTP dot Zach. That's reasonable. And then uh, connect timeout identity. We'll leave all of these things blank and then come down to port ranges. We'll say we're going to connect on port 80. Got to click the add button. I'm going to do it over TCP and we're going to attach it to the service. Off it goes. Now we have a identity with, oh, sorry, a service with a configuration attached to it. Now we're going to make a host V1 service. <clears throat> Another configuration. This is going to be HTTP Zach host V1. And here, this is important. This is going to be the address on the underlay we want the service to access. So I'm going to use my only router as the point of egress from the overlay network back to the underlay. And so that network will find down below, but I'm going to use local host as the offload point and 1408. Because if you recall, when we come back here, we do actually I have to SSH back to Amazon. If I curl to local host colon 1408, should get, you no, know, I'm being redirected to login. Oops, login like this. I should get a response. And so I'm going to use localhost 1408. I'm not going to forward the protocol, forward the address, or forward the port. I'm just going to map it directly as it is. And then uh, I don't need that because I'm not forwarding anything. I don't need to worry about this. And then I'm not going to bind it using an edge identity. Uh, I'm going to bind it using, um, so that means I'm not going to use this toggle. I'm going to bind it using this identity, which should be like IP my edge router. That's the one that's going to bind it. And then I'm going to attach to the service and that's it. I'm done. I click save. Now, a cool thing about the ZDCLI, ZD edge. So we have this thing called policy advisor. So you can find out if you did it right by looking at this. And when I do that, you'll see, oh no, none of your identities have access to any services. That means I've not made a service policy. All I've done is I've created a service. I did not authorize any of those identities to do anything. So now I got to go to service, uh, uh, service policies, policies, and I have to make a new policy. This policy is going to be HTTP Zach dialers. And these are the people that are able to dial Zach. And so, um, this, I can choose the service that I want to be able to dial, to be dialed. So I want, Okay, boy, I hope that, that does, I don't think that's working. Zach, I hope Jeremy, are you out there, Jeremy? He's not working. We're going to have to go back to the CLI. All right, so we're going to have to host it anyway. All right. This is not working the way it needs to work. This is definitely a bug. Somebody notify Jeremy that he needs to fix this. Maybe by the time we're done with ZDTV, he'll have it fixed. Anyway, we're going to use ZDCLI instead. Hey, I know you wanted to use command line anyway. So let's do a ZD edge, create service policy. If I look at that, it's going to say, uh, give me a name, give me a type, and then some flags. So I'm going to call this uh, HTTP Zach dialers. And the type is going to be dial. And then the service roles, is going to be at HTTP Zach. And the identity roles is going to be, what was that big long uh, thing? I Host it anywhere identities. Host it anywhere identities. Okay, could not validate. Oh yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Since it's got a pound sign and since it's bash, you need to slap that inside of single apostrophes. So now if I run the policy advisor now, if I run Policy Advisor, it says, hey, Clint has access to a service. Well, that's exciting. If I come over to my tunneler, if 
I click on this, this should be showing me an identity any moment that has access. Did I, did I do the wrong one? Oh, I know. I bet you I didn't give that identity the attribute, right? Let's go look and see if that's the case. Identities uh, via CLI. Click on this, click edit. Role attributes. It did not get the role. Oh, that's not working anywhere. Okay, so we can use the ZD CLI to fix this as well. So let's do a ZD edge update identity. And then uh, what's the name here? Oh boy. Okay. Here, and we're going to add an attribute. And the attribute we're going to add is this one. Now if I do a ZD edge list identities, you'll see I have two identities with this attribute. And by this time, aha, the dial capability is now on this identity. Very cool. All right. Last thing we got to do is we have to authorize the router's identity. When you run the quick start, your router will also have an identity. Do not confuse the router's identity with the edge router itself. They are same, they are, they are the same name. And I can't tell you how many times I have updated the attributes of an edge router and didn't update the attributes of the edge router's identity. They're not the same. So uh, uh, the identity of the edge router, named the same, but very easy to screw up. So make sure you update the identity. CD edge, update identity, add, uh, not an attribute. Actually, I don't even need to update the identity. I'm going to just make a service policy. CD edge create service policy. Again, reminder, name and then type. We're going to call this the HTTP Zach binder. And it's going to be bind. And service roles is app. HTTP Zach. And identity roles is you know, whatever this identity name is. And when we run our policy advisor, two OKs. Now the router is OK to not dial, but bind the service. And Clint is able to dial the service. So now if I did everything correctly, and this is a live demo, then I should be able to go to HTTP colon slash slash HTTP dot, in retrospect, calling it HTTP dot Zach was probably dumb. Port 80, but I don't have to put port 80 in. I do this and if it works, we did, we did a great thing. We didn't. So now we have to debug and figure out what it is Clint did wrong. Did anybody see what I screwed up? Journal CTL FUZD router. So now I'm going to just look at the logs of the router failed to dial the fabric use local host i'm going to use i'm going to change i'm going to change it has no terminators okay i'm going to just restart the router sudo system cdl restart zd router blocks and rerun this and see if it still says failed to dial failed to dial has no terminators okay so for some reason, the router's coming online and saying it has no terminators. And what that means is there's no place for the client to send data to. A terminator is the endpoint of the overlay's network path. It's where the traffic should go to. And then once the traffic is there, the uh, SDK application, in this case, a router, can decide what to do. And in this case, we're going to offload that traffic. But there are no terminators. If we do a ZD Edge list terminators, we'll see... There is a Terminator now. Cool. Uh, what is the, this is too, let me, I gotta shrink this so I can read it. One second. I gotta shrink it so I can read it. There it goes. All right, so it's got a bind, it's got an address, it's got an identity. That might be the problem. Did I bind it as an identity? ZD edge list configs. Show this and then, uh, Created that, updated that, config type. I want the hosted one. Host. 
Bind it using guide. Okay, it's set to false, but the identity is this. I think setting that listen options has caused a problem. I did not want to bind the listen identity. I don't use the Zach enough. That was my mistake. I should have I should have known better. So I need to oh go and update that config. Let's go back and update that config. That's annoying. Let's go to the config. Go to the host config. Edit. This was a mistake. I did not want to do this. I knew I didn't want to do that. Now let's do this again. And we'll see identity is empty. All right. And now we'll do journal CTL FU ZD router. And term receive terminator created. Now I come here. There we go. I screwed up the identity. Or sorry, the, the host creation, host config creation. And so uh, we see here Zach is going to come at some point. I don't know. I don't know what's the hold up. Where's the data? Give me the Zach already. I don't see any errors. There's a console error. Oh, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, so remember the core's policy violation, which I didn't try beforehand, but. Uh, we did get to the service. It's just not going to work via HTTP, which is fine. Uh, I need, you can also use localhost. So there's a course policy that's blocking this, which makes sense. Uh, maybe I'll do HTTPS instead. So let's one more small change to the host. Edit this. We will change the uh, we'll change this to eight four four three and save this, and then we have to change the intercept. I mean, we don't have to, we can keep it on 80 if we wanted to. 8443, actually, let's, uh, yeah, let's do that. Let's keep, let's add both, just to demonstrate that you can do both. Um, intercept, edit, and we'll add 8443 and 8443. When that happens, we'll see over here, I should get, oh, did I click save? Over here, I'll now have 80. Well, that's exciting. <laughs> we, we might have just found a different bug. Uh, did the tunneler seriously just crash on that? The tunneler seriously just crashed on that. We definitely found a different bug. That is unexpected. So let's turn it back on again. I have to show Sean that one because that was not what I expected to see. <laughs> Somehow we have a bug on adding an intercept port. Interesting, and it's still not set. All right, let's look at the ZDCLI because that doesn't lie. ZD as list figs minus J. And we'll see the intercept has 8443. So this is not showing me 8443. I am confused. Let's open the old UI. See if this is a UI issue. Okay, so the old UI just has just got or the new UI just has some sort of caching issue. It seems. Let's open the new UI back up again. I bet this fixes it. Where is the new UI? The new UI is grumpy. Come on, where are you? Okay, got an interesting problem with the new UI. Hey, three bugs we found in this one ZDTV. That's always super exciting. Love it. Um, but we do have 8443 available. So now if I go to HTTPS slash slash HTTP dot Zach colon 8443. Now I get the ZD console and there you go. We've protected an entire ZD application or an entire, an entire application via ZD. We've uh, created a service. We created two configs for that service. We created two service policies for that service. Uh, let's uh, just verify. Let's make sure it's the right one. Uh, let, let me log in and make sure no shenanigans. We're not just, you know, not a liar. So this should look the same as this. We'll go to uh, services. We see our HTTP Zach. Um, we have our configs. And so we can prove now, you know, we could close the Zach's front door to the internet and uh, be safe and secure. And there you have it. Now it's already at the end of the hour, so I won't go into the browser bring up, but 
look for the next, uh, that, that video will be coming soon. Um, and hopefully that was a fun ZDTV. Hopefully it was educational and we'll see you next time.